This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on economics and the reading on the firm and market structures. Do you remember in that very last recording, we talked about supply and demand, consumers and producers. Well, this reading is a focus on producers only. You'll see that as we go to this first learning outcome statement. And this is what you need to know. You need to know everything about perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, and a pure monopoly. So we're going to talk about the definition of those four market structures, and then we're going to talk about things like elasticities and marginal revenue and supply functions and factors and strategies and concentration measures. And so really, this could be one learning outcome statement for this reading, and it would sound something like, make sure you know everything about these four structures. So here they are. And in its simplest form, when you go from lots and lots of competition under perfect competition, I mean, that makes sense, to fewer and fewer producers that are in that process, then you have less competition. And then of course, a pure monopoly would be just one firm. So think there in the purple monopoly, one powerful firm, who can pretty much do whatever it wants to do. And what we'll see is that the, the pretty much what it wants to do depends on its cost structure. All the way down to perfect competition, which implies something like the firms really can't do anything that they wanted to. They are market takers. So there's a huge difference between the purple and the what is that? Almost a red down there at the bottom. So let's go ahead and describe characteristics of each of these types of structures. A monopoly is a profit maximizer. We'll see that in a graph here in just a few minutes under which a monopoly, and what did I say just a minute ago, depending on its cost structure is going to set quantity and price so that its profit is maximized. They're price makers, right? So the monopolist gets to pick what price that he or she, or rather it, uh, can charge in the marketplace. Very high barriers to entry, a single seller, price discrimination. And then of course, because if we swing back up to that first point, profit maximizer, that probably implies that this one firm is taking advantage of lots and lots of consumers which attracts the attention of people in government. And so pure monopolies tend, tend to be regulated in open market societies. They tend to. And there are some good examples down at the bottom. Here's one that, I've, uh, that I tell my students about all the time. Um, you know, if I'm Jim and I have my own water company, let's say I'm Jim's water company, and I have a monopoly in this area, you know, let's just say this is a pretty big area. Well, I probably didn't start my company, you know, when I got out of college. What probably happened is that my father probably didn't start this or my grandfather or my great great grandfather. And I'd have to go all the way back, you know, I don't know, hundreds of years, thousands of years, maybe go back all the way to uh, Fred Flintstone. You guys ever watch the Flintstones? You know, when Fred Flintstone was alive during the time of the dinosaurs, maybe Fred said, hey, you know what? I'm going to provide water to all of my friends and family around here. And then over the years, you know, when there were contracts that were originated, you know, Fred and his ancestors started signing all these contracts. So Fred was in charge of the water. And so he was my, you know, super great, great, great grandfather. And so now I'm Jim's water company and I'm now I'm now a monopoly. And that's what it means to have to have high barriers to entry, because I could have someone come along and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to provide water to these people over here. And and I'll say, well, go ahead, have at it. By the way, you see that lake right there? That's all mine. And you see the aquifer. I mean, you can't really see it, but there's an aquifer under the ground and that's all mine. And there's no water around this area for thousands and thousands of miles. And so the competition looks around and says, well, if I don't have any water, I can't be a provider of water. This might be considered a natural monopoly. 
Now, if we go to an oligopoly, let's, let's use my example again. Suppose that Fred, back in those old days, also had a neighbor named Barney Rubble, and Barney decided to go over there. And so there was a line drawn. Do you remember that one episode where they, drew, they built a fence in between their properties? So they built a fence, and Barney had that property over there, and Fred had this property over there. And so it was two different water companies providing water to all of these people. And then maybe their children, Bam Bam and Pebbles, got married, and they took this area down here, and maybe somebody took that area up there. So you have three or four firms that are providing this service. All right, so what are, what are characteristics? Look at the very bottom, a relatively small number of firms. Products are homogeneous, right, water. Over the long run, over the long run, Fred and Barney and Pebbles and Bam Bam are probably gonna make abnormal profits. Barriers to entries are still pretty high. Notice there's pricing interdependence. And then, of course, uh, each of those three oligopolists are going to try to maximize profit. And remember that if Fred and Barney are charging the same price for water for those people over here, and Bam Bam and Pe Pebbles are charging something different. Maybe it's a little bit more, maybe it's a little bit less. Well, these people, are they're, they're going to talk. They're all going to meet at Walmart. And so the pricing has to be, it's just going to be a function of some kind of dependence. The reading uses the word interdependence. Now, monopolistic competition is a completely different level. This is where we have lots and lots not only of consumers out there, but of producers. So instead of just two or three water producers, we've got 20 or 30. Now that's probably not going to work. And that's why we have these examples here, you know, oil and gas, airlines, natural gas, telecommunications, electri electricity. These have historically been, you know, just regular natural monopolies and naturally occurring oligopolies. But you have to go to a different industry to get a monopolistic competition like a fast food chain or clothing. So there's multiple buyers. And here's the key thing about uh, this MC structure, that branding and differentiation is essential to gain market share, which will then lead to profit maximization. Now there's some control over pricing because of branding. I'm gonna give you just a quick story here. Um, teeth brushing is pretty dull during, the, during our entire lives, right? I've been brushing my teeth for I don't know, 58 years. Now, when do you get teeth? When do you brush your teeth? Two or three years old? Well, last week I bought a new toothbrush and this toothbrush, Colgate Palm Olive, had ridges on the back of the, of the bristles. So as I'm brushing my teeth, the ridges, they're cleaning the inside of my cheeks. And when I was done brushing my teeth, I felt like I had been to the dentist. This is branding and differentiation. Now, I'm not quite sure if the toothbrush market toothbrush or teeth brush market, whatever, however you say it. I'm not sure if that's a monopolistic competition. It's probably close to it, but it might not be a, the, a, the, an, a completely accurate description, but branding and differentiation is key there. Few barriers to entry because, you know, am I going to, if I'm Jim, am I going to put out my own toothbrush? Jim's toothbrush, you know, here's my ridges here. Well, who believes in Jim's toothbrush? Colgate Palmolive, that firm has been around for a million years. So we know the quality behind that and we're probably willing to pay a higher price. So that's what that third bullet point means. Sellers have some control over pricing. Now, I forget what I paid for that toothbrush. Maybe it was four bucks or so. And I remember thinking, gosh, do I really, do I really want to spend $4 on a toothbrush? I mean, can't I just brush with my finger? I, I guess not. My sister's a dentist. She would scream at me if I brushed with my, with my finger. But if it were $8 or $12, I probably wouldn't have bought it. So there's some, some degree of control over pricing. Uh, but that is only to the extent that the product is differentiated and I'm confident in the brand name. Now, perfect competition, skip down to that second, uh, that second item. These are homogeneous products. So look at the bottom, agricultural products. So like a tomato, right? So if you, if you grow a tomato in New Jersey and New Jersey farmers, boy, they claim they have the, uh, the juiciest and the most nutritious tomatoes out there. And I, I wouldn't argue with them. But Pennsylvania has good tomatoes and, and Iowa has good tomatoes and Wisconsin has good tomatoes. Um, 
Now, what happens in this perfect competition is that there's just tons of buyers and sellers out there, right? Who buys tomatoes? Well, we, we buy tomatoes, right? Just because we love a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. But Heinz Ketchup buys way more tomatoes than I ever do or that we probably combine because they make ketchup. Paul Newman buys lots of tomatoes so that he can put it in his, uh, in his spaghetti sauce. So tons and tons of buyers and sellers out there which means that there's probably not going to be anything about the tomato market that that is a secret, right? That's why one of these characteristics is perfect information, right? If there is a, uh, let's suppose there's a worm that shows up in New Jersey, and this worm is eating all of those tomatoes in New Jersey, well, that word is going to get out pretty quickly, and we're going to say, let's stay away from those New Jersey tomatoes. And look at that fourth one there. The firm is a price taker, meaning that the tomatoes come to the market and all of us, all of us descend on the market, all of us consumers, the buyers, the demanders, we descend on the market and we agree on a price. And we don't really even care if we're getting it from New Jersey or Delaware or Indiana. We don't care where it comes from because a tomato is pretty much a tomato. And almost anybody can, you know, dig a hole in their backyard. My father was so proud of his tomatoes. He would, he would come out of his garden, you know, sometime around the end of June or July 4th, and he'd have this giant tomato. And he would say, look at this tomato. It was almost like he, he made it, like it was his little baby. <laughs> you know, so there are really no barriers to entry. And uh, um, there's really no ability for my father <laughs> or anybody out there to influence the price. That's that nature of, of a price taker. Now let's go ahead and think like an economist here, which means that we have to draw a graph. And so I can't imagine the Institute offering you a question stem that doesn't have a graph attached to it when attacking this LOS. So let's look over at that illustration, the red downward sloping line. There's the demand curve, right? And so the marginal revenue for the monopoly then is going to be more steeply and more downward sloped. And so what are we going to try to do as a monopolist? What we're going to do is we're going to produce that Q1 right there. You see Q1 on the horizontal axis. That's the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And once again, that marginal cost curve is like a smiley face, right? But it has a bigger, it has a bigger smile on one side of the face. And what did I say just a few minutes ago that, uh, you know, this price is going for a monopoly is going to depend on the cost structure. So that's what those two lines are, the marginal cost structure and the average cost structure. Of course, average cost is, is above with fewer quantities produced and the average cost is below the marginal cost when there are lots and lots of quantity produced. But this is where, what did we say earlier, that the monopolist gets to maximize profit. So they, so they produce at Q1 and that's the intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost. So you might be tempted, and this is going to be a great question on the exam, you might be tempted to draw an arrow over to the vertical axis and say, oh, well, that's the equilibrium monopolist price, but that would not be correct because what the monopolist gets to do is scooch up on the dotted line all the way up to the demand curve, right? And that's the price all the way over there, and that's going to be the price. And so the difference between that price and the average cost curve and that, that red kind of shaded block, that is the monopolist's profit. How about for the oligopolist? And so go back to uh, go back to Fred and uh, Barney and Bam Bam. What's interesting about the oligopolist is that it is described by what's known as a kinked demand curve. So I want you to forget about everything else on the graph, but I want you to look at the blue up at the top and then the red down at the bottom, there's a kinked demand curve. Here, here we call it the average revenue, but that's the kinked demand curve. And it's kinked because there are different elasticities. So to the left of the X under the blue, this is where we have a relatively elastic demand curve 
which means that price and quantity have a sensitive relationship between the two. But the red is a relatively inelastic, and that means that there's less sensitivity. Remember that condition for uh, elastic versus inelastic. If it's if it's greater than if the elasticity is greater than one uh, or less than one, so we have this kinked demand curve, which means which means then that what's going to happen is that there is some control over prices, and what's going to happen is that the oligopolist is going to produce right there at Q1. And that's going to be the equilibrium price, that P1, the market clearing price in, a, in an oligopolist market. And that's going to be where those profits are maximized. Now, for the monopolistic competition, we get away from that kink demand curve and we go back to the monopoly uh, illustration. So there's our demand right there and there's the marginal revenue. But now, but now what we're going to do is we're going to produce at the point where, see where that quantity one is all the way up to the demand curve, but our profits are going to be the difference between that average revenue and the average cost. And so look what we have in arrow points over there, high demand. If there's high demand, what's going to happen is that firms are going to raise their prices to increase the profits, right? They're going to raise prices, so they're going to, they're going to move backwards and to the left on that demand curve. If there's low demand, they're going to lower their prices to increase market share. So that's a really great question. Remember this for the MC structure. Uh, high demand or low demand. So somewhere in the question stem, the Institute has to say something like high demand or low demand. Now they might not use those exact words, but they might use a, a phrase or two that sounds like, oh, everybody wants to buy uh, these New Jersey tomatoes. All right, so that's a signal that there's gonna be high demand. They might say something like, nobody wants to buy those Pennsylvania tomatoes. That would be a signal that there's low demand. Now, perfect competition, we've got to divide this into a firm illustration and an industry illustration. So let's focus over on the left part. So there's the firm. The price is equal to the marginal revenue is equal to demand. So the curve is, uh, is a straight line and it is perfectly uh, parallel to the horizontal axis. And so the demand function, this is just P times Q. Remember what we said uh, earlier about characteristics is that there is, uh, uh, there is uh, almost no control, no control over pricing, right? The perfect competitor is a price taker. And so the consumers descend on the market, they pick the price, and then that's the market clearing price. Now, of course, this is uh, uh, highly elasticistic prices meaning that if you were to raise or lower the price, then nothing or everything would uh, uh, would be sold, right? That makes perfect sense. So then go over to the right-hand side. This is the industry supply and demand curve, which is the aggregate of all of those firms in there. So the industry, of course, is still faced with a downward sloping uh, demand curve, but but for individual firms, they're just price takers when they bring their product or service to the market. So look at that very last arrow point. The firm sets the quantity at level where marginal revenue is equal to zero. Now, I remember what I said earlier about uh, the monopolists pricing and profit maximization depends on the cost structure. So that's what this that's what this, uh, this LOS is asking us to do, to take a look at the firm's supply function. And notice there, you know, the supply right there, it's, you know, kind of curved upward. And, you know, you can kind of think of this, not, not always, but sometimes you kind of think of that curve as the, uh, as the marginal cost curve. But um, notice what we have written in there, taken right out of the reading, that the monopolist has really no well-defined supply function because it's a function of its cost structure. That's why it produces where marginal revenues equals its marginal cost. And so it doesn't really matter if I go back to uh, my original monopoly example, Jim's, Jim's Water Company, it's not really the supply of water, it's 
my cost structure, how much does it cost me to get the water out, to purify the water, to put it into pipes and then send it out to the consuming public? Because clearly I have tons of water in my lake and in my aquifer. So while I could really go out and say, all right, I have however many gallons of water in my lake and aquifer, that is not really gonna determine uh, what kind of a pricing structure and what kind of profits that I'm going to uh, search for. It depends on my cost structure. And so that's why the reading says no well-defined supply function. And that's almost identical, but similar. The reading uses the term similar for the oligopolis. And then very similar for the MC structure. But notice what it says here. That quantity is set by demand in the market for the monopolistic competition so that we still have this cost structure, but we are sensitive enough because we have some competitors out there that are going to take away our market share that the demand that we're seeing from the consumers is going to influence but still, that supply curve is not, uh, is not well defined. But for perfect competition, this is positively sloping and it's equal to the marginal cost curve. And that's what we have illustrated there. All right, let's go ahead and move on to determining optimal price and output for firms under each of these. And so in order to do this for the monopoly, we're going to go ahead and consider the price elasticity as well. And you can see the relationship there. So the marginal revenue is going to be equal to the price, you know, times some measure of elasticity. And that's just the result of some algebra. Then, of course, we know that the monopolist is producing at marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so that one minus the reciprocal of the price elasticity is going, is going to help determine what is that profit maximizing price. I'm not going to swing back to that previous slide, but you can go back to that slide where we had that rectangle of the, you know, it's kind of red, that gray, red shaded area. So, you know, what do we want to do? We want to make that bigger and we want to make that, we want to expand out those borders. And so this equation here is going to help us maximize that red rectangle. And for the oligopolis, uh, it's very similar. However, remember the characteristic that one of the distinguishing characteristics about the monopolist and the oligopolist is that there is probably some pricing interdependence. And so that probably plays a little bit of a role, but we're still going to produce MC equals MR. Now, profits under a monopolistic competition is going to be, of course, this is what we're this is what we're thinking of when we talk about when we look at that financial statement back in our FRA days, right? We're going to look at you know revenues minus total expenses on the income statement, let's say, and boy, dare I even go and say, you know what? Here we're relying on this term called economic profit. I don't want to say this because it doesn't have anything to do with this LOS and this reading, but I'm, I feel compelled to say it because I want you to think about this in terms of operating cash flow. Make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. So this is something similar, but we're going to call this economic profit because in this reading and in these LOSs, it's called um, economic profit. Now, economic profit and operating cash flows, they're not, they're not the same thing, but they are similar. And I think it helps to kind of uh, envision this process where what we're trying to do is we're just trying to charge as much as we can and spend as least as we can on the operating process. And then for perfect competition, remember that we're just going to charge a price that's equal to our marginal cost, right? And that's the, uh, that's the perfect example. So let's work through one of those. Here we have price is 20 minus Q, marginal cost 5 plus 2Q. What is the profit maximizing price and output? Well, we're just going to set those two for the perfect competitor. Set those two equations equal to each other do a little algebra, then do a little substituting, and we get a profit maximizing price and output of 15 and 5. 
Now, remember what I said a little bit in this recording, but I said this a, a bunch of times in the previous recording on supply and demand, is that most of the times in economics, we're focused on the short term, right? If we're the if we're the tomato farmer from New Jersey and we bring the tomatoes to the market, you know, we're hoping to sell all of them because, you know, the tomatoes, they're right there. If we don't do something with them, they're going to rot. <laughs> Now, of course, the ones that we bring to market, we intend to sell all those during the course of the day or the two days, whatever that is. Now, we could freeze some of them or we could, uh, you know, we could slice them and freeze them or we could do whatever we want to ship them somewhere else. But of course, of course, there are long term implications to producing a tomato. Most of our focus is on the short term, but of course, we can't ignore the long term. And that's what this LOS does. Explain factors affecting long run equilibrium. All right. So for the monopoly to maintain long run equilibrium, Fred and Fred Flintstone and Jim, right? If I'm if I'm the ancestor of Fred, we want to maintain barriers to new entrants. And the easiest way for us to do that is just by gathering all the water rights. <laughs> you know, this was this was one of the the plot lines to a really poor James Bond movie. I hate to say that, but that quantum of solace was all around water rights. That was kind of a dull. All right, under the oligopoly, right? If you have three or four firms and they're making tons of money, this is probably going to attract new entrants. And so what happens is that over time, those profits are probably going to decline to provide motivation for those new entrants to say something like, you know what, it's not worth it. You know, there's lots of barriers in the oligopoly market, but they cannot be overcome. In the monopoly market, they're pro they probably can't be overcome without any government interference. But in the oligopoly market, some of these new firms out here, these new entrants, they might be able to raise enough capital to enter that market. So, so that declining profitability over time then discourages from doing that. Monopolistic competition, long run declining profitability. Yeah, this is exactly what you learned in your management classes where, you know, a firm in its early days experiences lots of growth. So the product lines are growing, but after time they reach a maturity level, right? And so when, when firms reach a maturity level, those profits decline. There's not that much growth, right? Think of, uh, Think of Milton Hershey. What does Milton Hershey ever do? Do every day? He makes a bunch of chocolate bars, Hershey chocolate bars. Well, Milton Hershey's been making chocolate bars since the time of Fred Flintstone, right? And so Milton Hershey knows exactly how many chocolate bars to produce and how many chocolate bars that he can sell. And over time, that profitability declines because of a number of reasons, but the cost structure and and the and the uh, maturity of uh, of that individual product line. So of course they use innovation, they use product differentiation and and branding. We said that earlier. Perfect competition, this is the good one there. Long run zero economic profit. How about pricing strategy? So the monopolist uh, avoids raising prices too high for a variety of reasons, <laughs> most of which is to uh, make sure that the government is not aware that we're charging too high of prices or, or the government, if it is regulating that monopoly, says something like, well, you can't charge that high of a price. Uh, oligopoly prices set, set based on the actions of competitors. So this is what I was saying earlier. There's that pricing interdependence, but it's not, it's not dependent. It's not totally correlated and totally dependent, but they're related interdependent. There's branding and differentiation and then firms accept prices. All right, let's go to this last, uh, last LOS here about, uh, the problems with the market structures and the problems with monopolies, because the monopolist is taking advantage of its market power, being the only firm supplying this good or service. Well, we need to have some kind of a measure of is this firm really a monopoly or is this oligopolist market? Do these individual firms, do they act like they are one monopolist? Yeah. So we have two ways to do this. We have a concentration ratio and we have an HH index. 
So the concentration ratio is really just uh, what you learned back in kindergarten. You take the market share of the top three or four or five firms, depending on you know what kind of a market it is, what kind of an industry it is. And so if the market share is one or two percent, that sounds an awful lot like perfect competition. If the market share of three firms adds to 100 percent, well, then those oligopolists or those firms, they are probably if they add to a 98 or 99 percent, they're probably acting as a monopoly. Now, there's a whole bunch of limitations of the concentration ratio. Um, not least of which is that it doesn't really tell you about changes over time. It doesn't really tell you anything about potential for what is going to happen in the future. And so um, we look at this HH index and what we do is we square those market shares and then we sum those, which gives us kind of a better estimate of concentration highest value will be one for a monopoly. And I was fascinated by looking at this reading. I remember years ago as I was going through, uh, as I was going through some of these readings, this HH index gained a lot of attention in, from the CFA Institute, but it has really narrowed down into this reading. And so I think that if you know what's on that slide deck, I think, you, uh, I think you'll do okay. So let's go ahead and do some quick math here. So the top two suppliers, 20 and 30%. So the concentration ratio is 50%. Uh, the HHI is 0.13. And there are really no guidelines given in this reading about which of these are too high and which are these of too low. Um, so I would just live with being able to calculate those mathematically. All right, so let's identify the type of a market structure. So if there are lots and lots of firms in the market, then it's more competitive. If there is a higher concentration ratio, then it's less competitive. If there is more differentiation, that sounds like monopolistic competition. And if there is more elasticity, more sensitivity, then there's probably uh, more competition. And that takes us through the learning outcome statements. Let me just go ahead and remind you that, what did I say at the beginning of the slide deck? You need to know everything about uh, those four market structures, but let's go ahead and focus on those specific LOSs. And so you now have all that ammunition to be able to answer. I mean, this could be a series of four consecutive questions on the exam. Something about perfect competition, something about the MC, something about oligopolies, and then something about the monopolies. And it could be four different things, four different types of questions. And so you need to know all uh, of the material that we just described.